ready to start. So some of you have a copy of a book, a textbook floating around. If you've got one by you and you're done seeing it, feel free to pass it to someone else. We just want everyone to get to just have the tactile experience here. Um, just the, the short version of the genesis of this project. Actually, David wasn't planning to be in the room. So did you, did you take a minute and just talk about how this expanded out? Sure. So this started out as. Um, BYU has uh, a long time, over 25 years now, association with a number of school districts around BYU called the Public School Partnership. And part of that is the uh, curriculum coordinators from the districts get together regularly in a professional development setting. And so I went into that, uh, into one of those meetings four years ago now, and said, hey, you guys heard of open textbooks. Um, I know what's happening with your budgets. I think there's a really interesting opportunity for you to save money here if we could arrange to do a pile of open textbooks. And the district curriculum people said, the, the savings are kind of interesting, but what you don't remember about high school textbooks is when we buy a textbook, we hold on to it for seven or eight or ten years. And we tell students, no matter what you do, don't deface this book in any way, because six generations of students after you have to use it. <laughs> so deface here, of course, is a synonym for highlight in, take notes in, you know, mark the important parts, uh, make annotations. So the district curriculum people said, um, the savings would be great, but we're actually even more interested in the idea that we could print on demand a book that we give to a student, tell them Merry Christmas, highlight this book, keep it forever, because next summer we're just going to print more for the next batch of kids that come through. So we asked those curriculum coordinators if they'd help us identify people who participate um, in the study, and so we kind of, through a process, and I'm skipping over details now, but ended up working mostly with the Nebo district in these three science areas. We got teachers together for uh, professional develop multi-day multi professional development uh, kind of activity where we worked through the state science standards, looked at the OER that were available, they selected and compiled them, uh, pulled them together into books that look like this, and then uh, we made them available in print, but I'm oh, sorry, in PDF form for free, but also because there's so few devices in uh, Utah schools. Print on demand was our real strategy. So the overwhelming majority, 95 plus percent of students that participated in this study are using print copies as opposed to digital copies. And just uh, to give credit where credit is due, these are primarily um, K-12 textbooks. So that was the, the major source that we looked at in terms of we pulled the professional development together, pick out the parts. There was there's lots of interesting backstory. I mean, some of the books you know were this big and some were this big because at the time in our first round we had each individual teacher custom make their book. Turns out that was actually pretty expensive because uh, it's going for a thousand page textbook that doesn't work out. But then when we brought committees together and looked at it more holistically at the district level, we were able to come up with things that looked sort of like this. And there's a next generation that looks even better. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Back to you. Thank you. So we first looked at the cost saving estimate. We, we had some research that showed that about $46 per student or across six courses, $7.66 per student in each course for classroom textbook sets. Wait, Lane, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, bad sorry. Here. Sorry. No, this first, I just got to say, you have to understand this first bullet and the pain that went into bringing to you this first bullet. Yeah. So we called, we, we talked to people in the state office and said, how much do we spend on curriculum materials per student per year? And they said, yeah, and they said, I, I, yeah. you tell me. We said, okay, we will tell you. Uh -huh. And so one of, my, uh, one of my graduate students went and pulled together the audited financial reports for every district in the entire state for the last seven years and pulled the, the, pulled the uh, numbers off the instructional materials, textbook, budget lines, compiled those numbers, divided by the total number of students in the state. And this number, $46, that's the total textbook spend per student for all of the textbooks 
That's what we spend in Utah per student per year on instructional materials. And his name is Darren Oviet, and he did a monstrous job pulling that number. Sorry, Darren Oviet. Sorry. No. I get excited. I know, I love it, love it. You, you need to sit in a team meeting with these guys. I wish my research team meeting had as much passion as this one that I'm drawn into. We estimated these cost $5 per student for an individual textbook, estimated 266 savings per student. That's estimated, and I put it in quotes because uh, they'd already bought the, the classroom text, right? But if they had done it otherwise, we could have saved 4200 bucks. We had 1,612 students using these books that year. So here's the question, efficiency and effectiveness is it efficient. Yeah, efficient, we estimated a potential savings of 4,200 bucks. Is it pedagogically effective? If you have a personal copy you can take and study at home, probably better. If you have a personal copy that you can highlight and annotate, probably pedagogically more effective. Is it effective, innocuous, or harmful in terms of student achievement? There's our bottom line. So here's my null hypothesis. There will be no statistically significant difference between students using traditional classroom sets of textbooks and students using teacher developed individual textbooks in terms of achievement as measured by standardized year-end science CRT scores. We're getting beyond that grade problem, that GPA problem. These are standardized CRT scores, even after accounting for multiple confounds. The design... Sorry. <laughs> it's a team. This it's is a, a team, totally. I just want to make sure everyone realizes how exciting this is because <laughs> it's hard in college because there's just no standard measurement that everyone's taking. But in, in high school, it's different. Everyone's going to be taking the state CRT score, so you have much better experimental design with a clear assessment. I mean, just get excited. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. Well, baby literate. It's quasi experimental ex post facto comparison of group differences in terms of year end standardized CRT scores. And as my grandmother would say, Oi, the confounds already! <laughs> the confounds, you have to know when anybody's doing educational research, you know it is a, a, so messy. I tell students, don't ever do educational research. Don't do it! <laughs> we, had, we had issues of students who had a special ed designation. Um, English language proficiency, low proficiency designation. We thought in terms of previous science achievements, some kids did well last year, they did well this year. General academic achievement we had to control for. SES, some kids had, just have more access to. Lots of resources, gender, age. I tell you, just because they've reached age 12 and you think they have formal operations, they're still pretty concrete till about age 25, in my experience. <laughs> and so, I mean, there, you just see that formal operations, and you can even see it in the course they took. Earth science is probably the most concrete course. Fits younger kids. Chemistry, a little more abstract, less concrete. Maybe it just doesn't fit. We had to control for that. We had to control for teacher effect and selection bias, at least. So, what about teacher effect? I mean, somebody could come to us. We're all in defensive mode as researchers, right? Isn't it possible that teachers that are competent enough to develop their own materials are actually more competent than teachers in general? That question could be posed the opposite way as well. Isn't it possible that teachers who can't translate a written text into a good lecture are incompetent and they need to make up their own stuff? We don't know. I mean, this is all speculation, these crazy covariates. What we found was that te textbooks and teachers were completely confounded. No teacher was using both standard traditional textbook and OER. So it was completely confounded. So textbook might be a complete surrogate for teacher effect. We had to control for that. And so having a really bright postdoc student on your team really helps. And Jared's going to say, tell you how he devised a way to control for teacher effect. Before I do that, I want to, I'm an English teacher by, by training. I taught high school English. There are other things besides just how good of a teacher I was that controlled how my students did it on a standardized test, right? I got similar kinds of students as a result of what time of the day I taught, um, you know, what kind of people were in my class last year and, and what their friends were. But what ends up happening is, for whatever reason, some of it may be related to how good of a teacher I am, but most of it is probably not. There were correlations that, that previous year's patterns of results on my standardized tests as a teacher would predict pre the, this year's standardized test results pretty much as well as other things. That was a pretty good way of looking at it. There's a high correlation, like a 0.8 correlation on that. And so what we did is we decided to go back and look at patterns of, of 
CRTs for different teachers and to include that in the analysis. Now let me just go ahead and say this is flawed. There are lots of flaws with this. We're not saying, when we say teacher effect, we're not saying good teachers versus bad teachers. We're just saying the likelihood that students in this class had a distribution of scores given the distributions of scores in previous years, regardless of what caused that. We're, we're agnostic about what caused that. We're not saying teachers were good or bad, and we certainly wouldn't publish what teachers got what score, scores, but we feel like that really improved the analysis to do that because we're able to say, we'll take that out of the analysis and get an unbiased result as a result of that. Um, so we created standardized values of, of that, and, and you have a question. Go ahead, Wendy. Can you clarify for me, does that mean that you are, your results, you're comparing a single individual teacher, their test results, without OER to their test results with OER? Is that essentially so that, that So that would be a problem if we were doing that, right? We'd have a, a little problem. So what we did is, this, since this was a, a second year adaptation, we went back and took the first year that they didn't use the OER as the surrogate for this year's. And the justification for that was the 0.8 correlation coefficient from one year to the other. So we either used your last year's, or if you used the OER last year, the year before that. Okay. But all of the scores that we use were calculated before the switch to OER. Thank you okay. for asking that question. Does that make sense? Yes. That, and it's still an imperfect solution, right? There's still problems with that as it is. There will be. Right. I, there's not going to be a solution that's problem free. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay. We, we, we always went back to the first year that they weren't using OER. Okay. Okay, cool. So next, um, are you, do you have that to go to the next slide? As long as you said standardized value of teacher effectiveness is standardized control. It's not that interesting. No, okay. that's what no, we I did. Can, I can say this one. I can say this one. Okay. I can say this one. Then you stand up again. Great. There's also this the big enchilada in this um, educational research is selection bias. Isn't it possible that students are somehow selectively enrolled in teacher sections for whatever reason? And we have no random assignment to treatment and control. And so that was another big covariate. Oi. Because we using, had to control for it. We're using OLS regression. One of the assumptions is that we, we have non-correlated errors. That for this, this is boring for people who don't like statistics. But one of the assumptions is that, that, that there's... Front part of I'm happy. <laughs> so in our case, we're using propensity score matching again as, as a way to meet the assumptions of the regression, a way to mimic random assignment. So um, we have all these covariates available to us. We can calculate using... Um, Using regression, we can using logistic regression, we can calculate propensity scores, um, and we can balance on these. Essentially, what this means is that we can make it so that we have this big group of students, we can create a smaller group of students that are balanced on their covariates. In other words, you can tell us all the information about the about the student, what gender they are, what their race is. They have an equal opportunity. Every student has a roughly equal opportunity of being in either group. And, and that's really important because we meet the assumptions of the regression and it also leads to a more robust causal analysis. So um, this is really small, but you can, this is the balance, the post, the post balance. You know, we get 44.98% or 10th graders, 44.9. So we're like talking about eight hundredths of a percent um, where this was a big imbalance to begin with, what grade they were in, with what class they were in, what their mean GPA was. We had an imbalance across all these groups. Um, and we took those and we tightened them all up um, using propensity score analysis in R, for those of you who care about that. And then this is another graph that I created in R that shows um, what's the likelihood that the student in blue is in the control group given all the information we know about them? Well, if the student had a, a propensity score of 0.2, we were pretty sure they were in the control group. We, we would get that right, you know, three times out of four. That we would, if we were guessing, we would get that right. And the same thing down here, we would know that people over here were more likely um, to be in one of the other groups. By propensity score matching, we make it so it's virtually indistinguishable across groups, and that just really uh, leads to a more robust causal uh, inference. Although some of us don't believe in causation. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he had to say it. He had to say it. I had to, to, yeah, he had to say it. So here's the final results, and I know it's small, but that's okay because you're going to love the results. Okay. <laughs> And this is, this is double robust because we've already matched on a lot of these covariates. And then we throw them in again as covariates in a multiple regression model. So these guys are all like little piggies at the trough. And they're hungry. And some of them are chewing away at the, at the outcome variable. And they're also biting at each other. And, and, it, it, and so when you get this many covariates in a multiple regression, it is really hard to ever find what's left over of your real question. So. 
We have. We've, we've looked at their GPA, 2011 GPA, um, what course they, how they did last year on their test, uh, what, in this year on, the, on tests, I gotta say that, which test they took, how they did last year, how they did on scale score last year, gender, age, English language proficiency, special education, free and reduced lunch as a surrogate for uh, SES, and our, our attempt at teacher effect. And we still find that for the treatment, whether or not you used OER or that traditional, that we have a significant result. There's still enough variance left over for us to say, yeah, there was a difference. We could have won, you know, when you do a two-tailed test, you can win two ways out of three, right? If there had been a null result, great. We didn't hurt anybody. It was innocuous. But when it comes out in this direction, we actually did some good. And it's, it's, we're pretty, I'm, as the stats professor, I'm pretty impressed with what we pulled off here because I just don't expect to see it with that many covariates. It just chews up too much. Some Wait, just before you go off the slide, can I ask two questions? Yes. Okay, one, um, will you interpret the 0.65 estimate there for us? Oops. Yes, I will. These, these are non-standardized estimates. So in raw score units, students who had the OER textbooks did 0.65 units better. RT scaled score points, which really, as far as practical significance, is very small. If you were looking to improve student scores and you have to choose from a number of programs, textbooks would be a slow way of making a difference. We're not claiming this is the way to improve student scores. We're, so that's... You know, but we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't hurt anyone. And we had a little bit of Okay, question number two. Do you remember what the multiple R squared for this? How good of a model is this in terms of explaining the variance in student scores? I don't remember the multiple R squared. You do. I fortunately do remember the multiple R squared. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 0.64 for those of you who care about that. With all those covariates. Which means that we, in this model, are able to account for about 64% of the overall variance in scores, which for anyone who works in educational research knows that that's a pretty impressive model. We, we feel pretty proud of this one. What that also tells us is that we, we did pick up on the right covariates. Because all those little piggies chewing away, they took a big chunk out of the total variance in 2012 scale scores. <coughs> uh, did you have any interaction with your treatment effect and any of the other factors that might have involved us in that? And we looked at it. Yeah. And the, the answer is no. We, we hypothesized that there were some that might interact more than others. We didn't test the interaction term for every variable. But we didn't find one in some of the things that you might expect. You expect to see this maybe less in high school than you would in college for like free and reduced lunch, right? But we didn't see anything there. We didn't see anything based on uh, race either, which was another thing that we were interested in. If there was any uh, bias uh, based on that, we didn't find any of that as well. Yeah, and we couldn't test every possible interaction. You know, we had to rationally choose some, but we didn't find them. They weren't hidden. Yes. Reject the null hypothesis. There was a significant difference between students using traditional classroom sets of textbooks, students using teacher-developed individual textbooks in terms of achievement as measured by standard year in science, CRT scores, even after controlling for multiple confounds, students using teacher-developed textbooks perform better than control group students. Statistically significant, but you know, whatever that means in the end. So we didn't hurt anybody. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, 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 just, I love this project because the teachers who spent their time in the summer to put this together, um, and it's just, to me, I, I, I think it's beautiful. I think, besides the statistics, which, you know, we get excited about the statistics, the project <laughs> itself is inherently beautiful. I, 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 I am so appreciative of the teachers who did this. And then this is, is now expanding to the Utah Open Textbook Project, um, which is going statewide with the science textbook. So, actually, Sarah, will you wave your hand? So stand up and tell everybody who you are. So my name is Sarah Young. I'm the K-12 Science Specialist with the Utah State Office of Education. David's a really good pitch man because he sold me on this project for the entire state without all of the statistics. So, <laughs> um, what we did was last year, we basically took this statewide uh, with the help of David and pulled together teachers from districts across the state voluntary um, commitments from the teachers in terms of having a voice at the table to help create the statewide text. Um, did a two-day workshop that was focused on what is OER, what's the role of a textbook, and how do we create a textbook to support that role. 
We've rolled out um, pilots in 7 through 12 uh, across the entire state. David would have the numbers in regards to that. I mentioned earlier, I've listened to a lot of the presentations about post-secondary where it's about selling this to faculty. The biggest barrier we've experienced with teachers and with students is getting them knowledge of the product and the free resource. And as soon as they find out it's free, they want it. Um, and so it's, it's really, these guys do a great job presenting the numbers. I am going to come from more of the anecdotal side, but the difference it makes for teachers and kids to have access to resources at a no cost or low cost on direct to print not only facilitates better education in our classrooms and excites our teachers, but also creates a vehicle for change in education that we haven't had before when you buy a book for seven years. So, super appreciative. Questions? Uh, the number for this year is 35,000. 35,000 students are using these books this year. It's the first year of the statewide rollout. We expect it'll be, we hope it'll be much larger next year. What percentage of your teachers are doing it? Like what percentage of science teachers are adopting this book? Do you know? That's a, that's a oh, really good question. So the next step that we're going into is a review and revision of year one based on pilot teacher feedback as well as community feedback that was submitted through the website. Part of that is a survey process that will go through the state and say who's using these, what role are you using them in as a supplementary, as a single resource, do you use digital or print or a mix of both, and kind of to try and get at some of that data. But that should be happening in January. It's very exciting. So can I speak a little bit to the practical significance of this? So you said a .64 scale score on average improvement? Sure. So I'm now the director of accountability for the state of Idaho. It turns out schools really care about their ratings, <laughs> like whether they make UIP, or in our case in Idaho, we have a five-star rating system. And there are cases, and actually more than you would expect, where it comes down to one student's score, and it comes down to a point sure. on the statewide assessment, whether they are in improvement, meaning they have to do things and go through onerous processes to be in compliance, all of that. So <clears throat> there's a chance that one student improving by one point on a statewide test, as sad as it sounds, can actually have a huge, yeah. si significantly, practically significant mm -hmm. impact on the school in terms of how people view the school, in terms of what they have to do, in terms of money they get, um, and, and possibly for the student on whether they're proficient or not in terms of and you might not pay money for that game. You don't, might not pay a lot of money for that game, but if you could save money for that game, then that's a no-brainer. The other thing is, right, even though 0.64 is not really a huge practical number, especially when the standard deviation is 8, for those of you who like statistics, you can start to think about what, you know, what the beta weight is, the, the standardized beta is there. But um, at the cut score, maybe that makes a difference for students, right? If you're, you're, you're going up a point at a cut score, you know, for, made a difference for that one, maybe. I don't know. Are your slides on the um, Open Ed Org site? They are not yet. No, be a, we put our slides on SlideShare, not on the Open Ed Group site. I guess we could link to. But yeah. we'll get a front here from the. Um, so this Open Ed Great Dialogue. What we'll do, we'll edit the description in the online program. So actually, so one thing that hasn't been announced yet, it'll be announced tomorrow morning. Um, if you go back, say, for yesterday, for Wednesday, and look at the description for all the sessions that happened yesterday, at the top of each of them now there's a big button that says watch the video. And the videos for all the sessions from yesterday are already online. Holy cow. So we'll, we'll go back through for these and edit the descriptions, and at the bottom we'll put a link to the slides and start sharing. You guys say there's a paper, there is one where we're in the process of second round, submitting for second round reviews. Wait, so can presenters go and put the link to their own slide share for their sites? Yeah, you ought to be able to. Got to. Other questions? We'll also email any of us. We'll email anything you want. Yeah. Uh, if we have time, I've heard some of you talk kind of uh, with me just you know casually about this, but you showed the findings. What about some uh, conclusions in terms of why do you think you found the uh, improvement that you did? Um, just because the book was free, is it because we think the kids are using the books more because they're available? Do we think it's because the teachers are more aware of the content because they put together the book themselves? Do we think it's because the, the books are better tied to standards? I mean, what do we think might yes. be this? This, this. <laughs> this is my problem with science in general. You can generate more hypotheses than I can ever actually test. Well, get on so it. I'm, I'm, I'm just always in speculation mode. I will never catch up with the number of challenges or hypotheses. Okay. So Corey. David had the answer. No, Corey from Nebo District. Uh, Corey has the answer. In the chemistry class, it's because they're writing in the book. That's, that's the deal in the chemistry class. And the other two is the teacher knows exactly what's in there and what's not. 
and the students see, oh, we don't skip pages because it's all important. Mm -hmm. So by the, by the way, the big growth was in chemistry. Just so you, for your information. Well, it is our best teacher too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in closing, well, we I just control, we control for teacher effect. <laughs> I just want to say, is my team awesome? They're yes. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If you have one of these and you would really love to take it home with you, you're welcome to, or you can put them back up here. <laughs>